Amen. Well, good evening, everyone. It's lovely to see you here with us as we worship the Lord together. You're very welcome. Let me give a few announcements. As we begin, our Rooted in Christ, or the ladies Rooted in Christ, will be tomorrow night at 7.30 here in the church. For all the ladies who have been enjoying that study, it continues tomorrow night, so please do keep that in mind. And then on Wednesday, our home, home groups, the last of the home groups this side of Christmas, will be on Wednesday in the four homes uh, that they've usually been held in. And we will be looking at this little book, Spiritual Health Check, by Carl Lafferton in chapters 8 and 9. And you're all very welcome. If you haven't been in one of the home groups and you'd like to attend one, let me know and I can point you in the direction of a house that's close to you. And you'd be most welcome to come along. And on the first of Friday, the 1st of December, FBI at 6.30 here in the church, and then the youth club will be in Del Riata at 8 p.m. as per usual. Our church weekend, you're all very welcome, so please do see uh, Phil or Dave about that if you haven't already done so about the church weekend. And then Christmas reading, we have this little book by R.C. Sproul, The Advent of Glory, 24 little meditations, one for each day in the run-up to Christmas to encourage us as a church together. I thought this would be a lovely thing for us to do. And perhaps even in the evening services and the run-up to Christmas, I might get a couple of reports from some of you telling us how the Lord has been blessing you and encouraging you through it. It has got some prayers from Sinclair Ferguson, Tim Challies, Johnny Erickson Tata, and more. And I'm sure you'll find it an encouragement. I haven't read the book myself, but I'm looking forward to it. Anything by R.C. Sproul is always very, very, very good indeed. So please take one. They're £5 each. Give Maynard the fiver whenever you've got it. That's about half price. I got you a good deal because it was buying so many at once. So do take one with you if you haven't already done so. And it's one per family. I don't have enough for everybody, so take one per family and just pass it around the household and everybody read it together. We have some other resources for you as well. We have this Christmas Uncut. So please do take some of these with you and give those out. We have enough. There's plenty of them. I think I got it. There's a hundred of them there. Um, but Give them out deliberately. Don't just throw them out to anyone. Someone you've been talking to perhaps in your workplace or even in your family or something like that. And they want to know a wee bit more about Christmas. It's a very simple book, Christmas Uncut, why it re What Really Happened and Why It Really Matters by Carl Lafford. And that's the same guy who's written this little book that we're doing on Wednesdays in our home groups. So take them free of charge and give them out uh, as the Lord enables you to those uh, who are interested in knowing more about the gospel. And then our carol service invites are out there as well. Take them and distribute them as you can to family and to friends for the 17th of December at 4 p.m. We're trusting the Lord for a lovely afternoon in his presence. So please keep that in your prayers and also take the invites and pass them around. That would be much appreciated and we'll trust the Lord for a lovely afternoon and the run up to Christmas. That's all the announcements that I have. Just to say that I have been approached by about membership and so if anyone's interested in baptism and church membership, come and speak to me. Perhaps you're thinking about it. Perhaps you're not sure. That's okay. Come and talk to me, and we'll think about getting some classes organized, and I can give you some more information with regards to it if you're interested. I think that's all the announcements that I have. I want to just read a single verse, a verse that relates to the passage we're thinking about tonight from Romans chapter 1. Here we have Psalm 19 and verse 1. It's entitled in the ESV as the law of the Lord is perfect. And the lovely psalm divides into two parts. You have general revelation, you have special revelation. General revelation being that that comes through creation. Special revelation, that which comes through the Holy Spirit applying the law to people's hearts. But it opens the psalm with these lovely words, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Here we have a beautiful description of general revelation, that revelation of God that is given generally to all the world, saint or sinner, Christian, non-Christian, everyone has the blessing of this wonderful revelation of God in creation. And we come before the Lord tonight who has created and sustains all things and let us pray and ask him to move amongst us as we're here. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the beautiful revelation that we have of you in creation. As we look out upon our world at this time of autumn, heading into winter, we see your handiwork everywhere we look, in the stars at night, in the rain that falls, in the flowers that grow, in the leaf that's now falling from the tree. We see everything 
with your fingerprint upon it. And we thank you for the God that you are, one who has created and one who sustains all things. And as we look out with the rest of our world upon your creation, we say how great thou art. You are a wonderful God. But yet you're a God who has not just restricted your goodness, your power, and your majesty to creation, but you're one who has also revealed yourself to us through redemption. We come as your people tonight who have had our eyes open to the glory of your Son, the Lord Jesus, who died upon the cross for us. And as we come, we are thankful. We're thankful that our sins are no more. We're thankful for the assurance that we have through your blessed Spirit that we are at peace with God. And as we're in this place, we want to give you the praise and the worship that you're due. So help us. Help us to set aside those things in our lives that take up so much of our attention. And so many of those things are quite innocent and menial in themselves. But nevertheless, at times like this, they can distract us. And Father, tonight we want to focus entirely upon you. And we ask for your help. I pray for every person who's bowed here in your presence. I thank you for them. And as they're here, I ask that you would meet them at the point of their need. There are some here who are struggling Perhaps family situations, looking after loved ones can be, can be tiring, can bring many, many anxious thoughts and concerns their way. And as they're here, I pray they would know your peace that passes all understanding. There are some who'd love to be here but who can't, who are struggling in body with sickness, perhaps watching online, and we ask you'll bless them. There are other of us, others of us here who perhaps are struggling with temptation, Perhaps the week that has passed has been a week of, of failure, of, of mistakes, of disobedience. And perhaps there are people here who are therefore feeling like they shouldn't be here. Oh, now, Lord, I pray that by your Spirit you would have them to know that this is the very place that they should be, here in your presence, with a repentant heart, and finding you to bring great comfort to their souls. So move amongst us, whatever our needs may be tonight, and have us to bring you glory. We do continue to pray for our Christmas period that's about to start. We think of unsaved people that will come in through our doors at the carol service and through different events. And Lord, we pray that you would increase your kingdom through us, that you bring glory to your own name through us, and that Christ would be uplifted. So help us today. Help us going forward as we look to Christmas. Thanking you for the incarnation, for God who became flesh, your son. And so be with us tonight, we pray. In Jesus' precious name we ask. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand together and we're going to sing a lovely piece. We're going to stand and sing, Come O Fount of Every Blessing. Then I'll let you sit and we're going to sing a new piece. But I'll let you remain seated for the first time we sing it, just so you can get on to the tune. But let's stand for this first one. Come O Fount of Every Blessing. Let's sing this out together. Jesus. 
Be seated. Well, we're going to sing a new piece together tonight. Some of you may already know this, Sing We the Song of Emmanuel. It is a Christmas piece, and so we're hoping to learn this so that we can introduce it into our Christmas singing on the run-up uh, through the next few weeks. It's a lovely piece. It's fairly straightforward. I think you'll pick it up uh, very quickly if you don't already know it. It's simply three verses, three choruses. There's no, uh, nothing really fancy about the tune or anything like that. But the three choruses do change, but the tune's exactly the same. I'll sing it. If you know it, join in. And then we'll sing it again right at the very end of the service just to try and get the song into your minds. Let's sing together, if you know it. peace. We sing the song of Emmanuel. We'll sing that again at the end of the service. I'm going to invite Amos to come just now to bring our consecutive reading to us from Luke's Gospel, chapter 20. Thanks, Amos. Uh, reading from Luke 20, and verses 27 down to 47. There came to him some Sadducees, those who deny that there is a resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife but no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children. And the second and the third took her. And likewise, all seven left no children and died. Afterward, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had her as wife. And Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot die any more, because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection." But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now he is not God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Then some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well, for they no longer dared ask him any question. But he said to them, How can they say that the Christ is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, 
The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David thus calls him Lord, so how is he his son? And in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, beware of the scribes who like to, talk, who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the place of honor at feasts, who devour widow, hot widows' houses and for pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Amen. Thank you very much, Amos, for that lovely reading of God's Word. Well, just before we turn to the Scriptures tonight by way of preaching, we're going to sing another piece. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. Beautiful, beautiful old song. Let's stand to sing this piece together. be seated. Well, if you'd like to take your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Romans, please, to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. We'll begin to read at verse 18.
Romans 1 and verse 18. I'll read through to verse 23. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. We'll stop there. We trust the Lord will bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, as we are before you just now to consider this passage, we ask that you would speak to us. We need you. We need you that we might understand your word. And if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, Lord, they need you. They need you to move by your spirit. And we pray that you would do that just now. We don't just pray for ourselves. We think of Mullet Mean tonight and we pray for Andy as he's there that you'll bless him, that you'll use him as he speaks. We think of Ben over in Coleraine with the baptismal service tonight. We ask that you'll use him and that you'll encourage our brothers and sisters in Coleraine Baptist as the service takes place tonight and people go through the waters of baptism. Well, Father, we thank you for the impact of your word in our churches, in our association. And we pray that tonight that that word would have free course pointing people to Jesus and bringing glory to your wonderful name. We pray this for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. You know, Paul S. Rees was a preacher from the 1900s. He said these words, the gospel is neither a discussion nor a debate. It is an announcement. The gospel is neither a discussion nor a debate, it is an announcement. And this is the position of the Apostle Paul as he writes the book of Romans. He writes this letter to these Christians who have become divided. When initially established, it was a church made up of Jews and Gentiles. But according to Acts chapter 18, the Jews were cast out of Rome for a period of around five years. During that time, the Gentile believers that were there established themselves with their Gentile cultures and their backgrounds that they were coming from. But the Jews have since returned, Jewish believers, and so you've got Gentile and Jewish believers coming together, and there's been all kinds of divisive issues coming to the fore. Paul writes to unite them, and he wants to unite them with the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And what is that gospel? Well, it's not a discussion. It's not a debate. It's an announcement. This is his position. This is the gospel of God. And it all centers around a single person, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was crucified and resurrected. And Paul, he writes to this church in Rome, feeling obliged to tell all of the world about the risen Savior. No exceptions. All Jews. All Greeks deserve to hear it. He is indebted to them. And so he writes, I am not ashamed of this gospel because through it, the righteousness of God comes by faith. This is what he writes in the introduction, verses 1 to 17. But there are a number of questions that come our way quite naturally as we consider the opening 17 verses. Questions that come our way are questions like, well, why? Why must people live by faith alone? 
Why is the righteousness of God that Paul talked about in verses 16 and 17 so necessary? And chapter 1, verse 18, through to chapter 3, verse 20, provides the answers. See, here the Apostle Paul, starting with where we are tonight, right through to chapter 3, provides a dark picture of people who cannot earn their own salvation. They are in sin. They are opposed to God, the enemies of God. And Paul here writes to address that issue. He paints a very, very dark picture. But it is in the darkness of the picture of man's state that the gospel shines most beautifully. And in doing this, in painting this picture, Paul highlights why the gospel is required in the first place. And why should the church concentrate on the Great Commission? Why should it focus on evangelism, reaching out to the world? Well, the church can be engaged in many worthy, charitable causes, but the gospel is to remain central. And why? Well, Paul highlights three things in the verses that we've read together tonight. He gives us three initial reasons. There's many more that we'll consider in the weeks ahead, but there's three initial reasons that he gives in verses 18 through to 23. The first thing he tells us is that the gospel is significant. The gospel is needed. The gospel is important. Why? Because God is enraged. Look at verse 18 with me. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now, notice with me that verse 18 opens with the word for, meaning that it flows out of what he's just written in verses 16 and 17. And so God's wrath, God's rage, makes the gospel a necessity. See, God's wrath is bad news, but it makes for the good news, the gospel, the gospel that thrills, that excites, that empowers the church. Why? Because it brings freedom from God's anger. See, God's wrath that's here written of in verse 18 refers to God's fair, right anger towards sin. And this, according to the Apostle Paul, is a present reality. The wrath of God is resting upon the world, the human race. God is currently angry with the sinner. And why? Well, because of godlessness. Because of wickedness. And here the Apostle Paul is presenting this concept using the words of godlessness and wickedness of the total sinfulness of man, of humans. And it's causing God to be enraged. You're taking the word godlessness. It's a reference to a disregard for God's law. It's an idea of the rejection of the vertical relationship that can exist between God and man. Wickedness, that's an outworking of that godlessness. It's a disregard for others. It's more horizontal in its nature, if you like. A rejection of the horizontal relationships for your fellow man. So the relationships between God and man, between man and fellow man, are disturbed. This is the essence of sin in the Apostle Paul's thinking. And it has stirred up the anger of God. A.W. Pink, the very good writer, says these words, the wrath of God is the holiness of God stirred into activity against sin. The wrath of God is the holiness of God stirred into activity against sin. See, the Bible is very clear, friends, that God is a consuming fire in Hebrews chapter 12. Psalm, Psalm 7 tells us that he's a God who feels indignation every day towards sin. We also read in the Psalms that he hates wickedness in Psalm 45. That he's angry towards all who live in a way that is contrary to his holy character. And therefore, he will condemn the sinner on the day of judgment. His righteous justice demands this. And the Lord Jesus reinforces this repeatedly throughout his earthly ministry. 
You know, we live in a day and age where the church sometimes shies away from speaking about hell. But if ever there was a hellfire and brimstone preacher, it was the Lord Jesus. Jesus in Matthew 5 talked about the, the fiery hell. Ch Matthew 7 talked about fiery eternal destruction. He talked in chapter 8 of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And he talked of how this was the destiny of those who suppressed the truth, those who closed their minds to the truth that God has given. And the reality is that there's no other way for people to be saved than through the gospel. The reality is that it is significant. The gospel is significant because hell is real. For God's anger is real. The gospel alone provides Deliverance from the fury of God. There's no other way. The cross where Jesus died is the only means of escape. And so the wrath of God is the context for the gospel. The former, the wrath of God, it is the problem. But the latter, the gospel, that's the remedy. And this is what the Apostle Paul highlights in verse 18. Why is the gospel significant? Because God is enraged because of sin. But following on from that, the gospel is significant because, yes, God is enraged, but is, the gospel is also significant because man is without excuse. Look at verses 19 and 20. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. So Paul, he anticipates, Paul anticipates the objection that all people who are carried away in godlessness and in wickedness, they simply don't know any better. How can God hold such people to account when they just don't know the error of their ways? They don't understand it. They're living in ignorance. Well, Paul addresses that very question. And he says, the creation reveals the existence of God. We've read of that in places like Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. And here we have a reference from Paul in Romans 1 to natural or general revelation. And this general revelation can't save, but it does remove all excuses from everyone in the world. You see, while God is invisible, the truth is plain to all through God's creative power and his goodness in sustaining the universe, that he does exist and deserves allegiance. This is Paul's argument in Acts chapter 14. There he's with Barnabas, he's in Lystra, and he talks of how God doesn't leave himself without witness. And then Paul goes on to talk about the rain and have fruit and food as actual witnesses to God's existence. And Paul's point is that all people everywhere are responsible. They are accountable creation. The very fact that the world exists removes all excuses that any person may have. And to disbelieve, for a human being to reject what the Bible teaches, requires, therefore, for the Apostle Paul, a rejection of common sense. Gee, look out into the world, Paul's saying. Look at what you see with your eyes. Creation that testifies to God's goodness and it removes all excuses. And to say God doesn't exist, well, that just doesn't make any sense at all. This is effectively what Paul is saying. And so as he writes, in, or as it's written by Luke about Paul in Acts chapter 17, God commands all people everywhere now to repent because there's coming a day in which God will judge the world in righteousness through his Son. And how can he do that? Well, because there's sufficient evidence in creation that removes all excuses from any unbelievers. But yet... Yet we do live in a world, even still, where many people make excuses. The Lord Jesus understood this. He spoke of it in Luke chapter 14 in the parable of the great banquet. 
There we have this parable that symbolizes the kingdom of God. And in the midst of the parable, what do we read? We read, come now, for, for all things are now ready. Welcoming people into the kingdom, into the banquet. But those who were invited to that great banquet began to make excuses one after the other. There was one who said, oh, I've just bought a field and I must go and tend to it. Another talked about oxen or cows. And then there was one who said, oh, well, I just got myself a wife and I have to go and look after her. They all used these excuses. And what does the Lord say of them? None of those men who were invited shall taste of my banquet. See, their excuses meant they were excluded from the banquet altogether. And excuses on the day of judgment will not work for anyone. All shall be found guilty as charged before God. And there will be various excuses on that day, I'm sure. And it seems to me that all the excuses that you hear people use, they fit into one of three categories, but none of them are acceptable. They'll stand before God one day. I'm sure there'll be some who'll say, I didn't do it. They'll deny it altogether. But the God whose eye penetrates the human heart, who knows all things from beginning and end, he cannot have the wool pulled over his eyes, and so denial is not going to work. Then there'll be others who'll say, oh, it's not my fault, the devil made me do it. You've heard people say that, haven't you? But oh, this, eye, this God who can see into the very motives of the heart, oh, he's not going to swallow that one either. Then you'll have others who will try and find themselves some kind of middle ground and appeal to God's mercy by saying, oh, well, yes, I did it, but, but my circumstances made me do it. And again, you're dealing with a God who understands all things, who understands us better than we understand ourselves. And so God will not give in to such excuses for he knows what we really are like and he will condemn our sin. And so therefore, for the church today, and this is the point Paul is making as he writes about the significance of the gospel, is that world evangelization is necessary for all men everywhere are left without excuse. So the church should never be selective in its evangelism. It should never prioritize certain cultures over others. It should reach out to all without excuse. Why? Because all cultures are left without excuse before a holy God. This is why the gospel is significant. For God will not accept excuses. The only person that God will accept on the day of judgment is the person who's trusting exclusively in the Son of God who died upon Calvary's cross. And this must motivate us. This should motivate us. This is why Paul is writing to the church in Rome. He wants to motivate them with the wrath of God. The fact that God is enraged by sin. And he wants to motivate them with the fact that man is left without excuse. Thirdly and finally then. Why is the gospel significant? Well, because God's glory has been exchanged. Look at verse 21. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Now, this is a time of the year, well, I suppose it happens all year round, but in particular, we're coming up to Christmas. And there, there will be a lot of exchanging being done over the next number of weeks. People will be returning gifts and exchanging them. It happens at Christmas. Now, media, uh, I find a media report, a news report from 2021, that said that the first Christmas return on Christmas Day was at three minutes past six in the morning. Christmas morning. Somebody wasn't too happy with their gift and they took it straight back. They took it to a collect plus store in Stockport. 
And apparently, this is 2021, now there were actually more in 2019. I found a report for 2019, but the most recent one that I could find was 2021. And it said that 398 parcels were returned in the UK on Christmas Day to collect plus stores by people who didn't see the value in the gifts that had been given at Christmas. And you know, by nature, People treat God this way. The world has exchanged the truth about God for a lie. They give their attention and their affections to what is created rather than the actual creator. They take creation over the creator. This is why they've been left with no excuse. See, their sin and their rebellion against what creation testifies has left them under God's judgment. And Paul's point is that by nature, people have exchanged their object of worship. They have traded God for something else. They have substituted him for something else. See, man has been created to worship God, but now he turns his back on God. He's not grateful, but now he's self-motivated. And what's Paul talking about here in verses 21 to 23? Well, he's referring to the Roman culture. A culture that was overladen with idolatry. Instead of trusting in the one true God, they made their own gods out of wood and uh, metal and precious stones. Oh, they knew God, but, well, they did their own thing. They didn't honor him. They didn't give thanks to him. Instead, they became futile. They chose to ignore him. They ignored what creation was testifying, and they got involved in that which was, which was futile, that which was empty and worthless. They were foolish. Their foolish hearts were darkened with no desire to live in harmony with God's law or with God himself, and so have become those who face his judgment. And the interesting thing here for the Apostle Paul is that often when we read the word foolish, we think of people who aren't intelligent. We think of people who are silly. But actually, that's not what Paul is talking about at all. When he talks about these people who were foolish in their hearts, hearts that were darkened, he's not talking about a lack of intelligence. He's talking about people who made a deliberate choice to live independently from God. They took what was good, creation, and they've made what was good into God, and there ends their problem. And this has undone the created order. Creation being made to be enjoyed, creation declaring the glory of God, but creation has now become a God for these people, for God has been devalued in their hearts. Their value, their glory is being given to something of no lasting value. This is the essence of sin. And it will not be tolerated. And now today, we live in a different culture, a different age. And idols today tend to be mental rather than material, whereas idols in the past were made of stones and, and wood and precious metals. Today, they tend to be more mental. You know, people and their priorities have got caught up in idolatry by the things that they value, whether it be possessions or position in life, whatever it happens to be. But the problem remains the same. These people all around our world claim to be wise, thinking so highly of themselves, but actually, they're foolish in God's sight. For what they're doing is they're rejecting the Creator, and they're favoring something within creation. And in essence, they are missing out on the purpose for which they've been created themselves, which was to worship God and enjoy Him forever. This is what the Westminster Shorter Catechism says, that man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Or as John Piper puts it, man's chief end is to glorify God by enjoying Him forever. But man is missing out on that. And in missing out on that, he is left without excuse. God is enraged, for he has exchanged the true God for a false God of his own making. And all this makes the gospel necessary. It makes it essential. 
For only with the cross can God's wrath be exhausted. Only through God's wrath can the flames of God's anger be extinguished. See, without the gospel, there is no hope for the human being. This is what Paul is effectively saying as he writes to this church. Without the gospel, mankind is in a burning building with no way out. Hence the need for the gospel. And we must proclaim this, brothers and sisters. We must proclaim this, proclaiming that Jesus, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, delivers from the wrath to come. And could it be, could it be that we spend lots of time talking about the gospel? And we certainly should. But do we spend enough time focusing on and communicating why the gospel is necessary? Talking about the wrath of God is never palatable. It's a difficult pill to swallow for the world, and it's certainly not going to make us popular. But unless the world understands why it needs the gospel, it's never going to reach out for the gospel. And so we must rediscover the place in our preaching, in our communication of the gospel, we must rediscover the place of God's wrath. And we must remember that the gospel is neither a discussion nor a debate. It is an announcement. We must announce to people the necess necessity of the gospel but in order for them to understand the necessity of the gospel, they need to see the bad news. It's the bad news that makes the gospel the good news. And so we must warn sinners to flee into the arms of Jesus and remind them at all times that Christ will receive all who will come by faith. And my friends, tonight I realize that I've been talking to Christians seeking as Paul is with the, to the church in Rome to motivate them with why the gospel is so important. But perhaps there's someone here tonight and you don't know the Lord Jesus. You're not saved. Well, friend, you need to understand the seriousness of your situation. That the wrath of God is resting upon you. God is angry with you. He's enraged by you. Why? Because you've exchanged the glory of God and given it to someone else or something else. You've been worshipping something else in your own life rather than Him. And He will hold you accountable. But the good news of the gospel, and let me leave this on a positive, let me leave this on a high, the good news of the gospel that Paul has just talked about is that it is the power of God unto salvation to all who will believe. So the anger of God that rests upon the sinner can be lifted. And rather than having anger thrust upon them, they can have acceptance. Acceptance. This is the good news that Paul highlights here in this wonderful letter to the Romans. And it must motivate the Christian. But it must challenge the unbeliever. This is the essence of the gospel. This is the significance of the gospel. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the gospel. Thank you for what it does. It delivers us from the wrath to come. It brings peace with yourself. And we are so thankful for it. But, oh Lord, we realize tonight, having thought about Paul's words, that this is not a message that we should keep to ourselves. But we must share it with all. So help us as we think of the week that's to come, as we rub shoulders with people in our workplaces, in our communities. Lord, help us. Help us to declare gently, lovingly, but boldly the good news of Christ that has come to address the bad news brought about by sin. 
So help us in this, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Folks, we're going to sing together that lovely piece that we sang earlier on in our service. We're going to sing, we sing, sing we the song of Emmanuel. Let's stand to sing this lovely piece as we come to a close. And don't rush off tonight. There will be some tea and coffee, and you're welcome to stay around for some fellowship. So please do that if you can. Let's stand to sing. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus. Thank you for the greater remedy for sin that is your Son. And we as your people, we're so thankful for the benefits of the gospel that have been wrought in our lives. Thank you that as far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our transgressions from us. Thank you that we are at one with yourself and with one another. Thank you that we have a hope called heaven. And one day we will be there enjoying eternal life forever in the presence of the Savior. And Lord, we ask that as we leave this place tonight, that we will hold on to this hope and that this hope will spur us on and compel us to keep reaching out to others. We thank you for our time together tonight. Thank you for the encouragement and the challenge that comes from your word. And we ask that you'd help us this this Christmas period to go and tell others of Jesus. We pray this for his name's sake.